and welcome to Liquid Lunch. We're coming at you live from downtown Toronto. You can see downtown Toronto. Yes. Right there. That's our. Uh, that's look what we're at looking the at right now. That look like Those ants. Hold on. Oh so wait, small. down I here. Could I can crush this you. fellow right here. Like <laughs> beep 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 beep. <laughs> I can crush him. <laughs> and this is what we do. <laughs> Aaron, it's, great to have you on the show. Thank you. On a Wednesday. It seems we have all the intelligent conversations Before, off camera. <laughs> and then we can just get stupid when the, you right. know, when the show starts. But. Um, what were we talking about? Oh, <laughs> Some so many things. Interesting yes, things. currency and... Alternative currency and yeah. uh, organizational things. Yes. Okay, let's get into that. All right. We'll I want to talk about this. You do? Yes. All right. What it is for... Uh, should we? Yes. I don't know if we should. Okay. Should we show it? I think you should show it. I think it's great. It's just You a, can maybe explain what brought this all about 20 years ago. I can't, I can't go into ago. details. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's what? 20 years ago. Okay, we're talking about, while well, we were talking, I sit on the board of the Toronto Dollar right. Organization, right? And uh, I've, um, I used to be president, actually, for a little bit. Mm -hmm. Just for a little bit, then they, it's a long story. But, anyways, um, and I've been, I was uh, w involved with the LETS system in Toronto mm -hmm. before that, the local e employment e and trading system, which mm -hmm. is, uh, it's a global movement, really. It started in British Columbia, and now there's communities all over the world that are using the LET system, which is another model for an alternative currency system. Right. Yeah, and um, so I've been in. in I, I think I started when I was a little kid. I, 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 my, I think my dad had a, a magic trick. Okay. And what he could do, he'd put it, he'd put it up to my ear, and he was able to produce quarters. Right. Right, and that got me started thinking about money. How funny! <laughs> I thought, why don't you just make more of that? Do more of that, Dad. Why do you have to work every day? Just keep pulling those quarters the money out of my tree. ear. Yeah. <laughs> That's even easier. I can make it myself. So I asked yeah. my dad if he was a millionaire, because he heard it. You know, right? I said, he said no. I said, are you a thousandaire? <laughs> That's cute. He started laughing, and then I said, okay, how about a hundredaire? <laughs> how old were you? Like, uh, I don't know, maybe six or seven, something That's like that. That's pretty cute. I would have given you 20 bucks or something for all that. <laughs> that was a lot Very of money sweet. in those days. Yeah, of course. But, but anyway, I started thinking about mm -hmm. money, and I thought, thought, why don't they just... I asked my dad about where does money come from? Mm -hmm. Why don't we print more? That way more people will have more money. I used to and then say he the said, well, you thing. can't do that because if you printed money and you didn't have the yeah. goods and services to go along with it, it would be inflationary. And so I just started thinking at that age mm -hmm. all about money what it is what it's for how it could be better and stuff like that so when um i found out about the, the let system mm -hmm. in toronto here's a funny story do you know sut kalsa do you know him mm -hmm. he was the guy that brought um let's to toronto okay. so let's as i said started in british columbia by mm -hmm. michael linton sut is actually from saskatoon mm -hmm. So the funny thing was, I, I heard about this as I was because uh, I was publishing a, a magazine at the time, Transform Magazine, mm -hmm. and I heard about this LET system. And I thought, oh, this is awesome! I want to find out all about this. So I went to some event they had, mm -hmm. and here's this guy, he's like a Sikh, you know, Sat yeah. Khalsa, dressed in the ceremonial Sikh garb, and he's the guy that brought this to Toronto. And then I found out a couple years later, mm -hmm. this is a long story, but I used to also. In those days, so for a while, I had a second job where I was delivering the Globe and Mail. Right, I know that. You know that job? You told me. Oh, did. Okay, so <laughs> I did that. So anyway, every day at 3 in the morning, I would show up up at the uh, the liquor store up at Summerhill, mm -hmm. Young and Summerhill, to get yeah. all my papers to go deliver into my neighborhood. And there was this guy that would always park beside me, and he was like just some dude that was like, you know, Anyway, I found out after I see Sut in all this ceremonial garb, I found mm -hmm. out like a couple years later that th that was him. He was doing oh, that no too. Way. So we were both doing that same job and we'd be f very friendly and helping each other out. Very interesting. Uh, in, the mo in the early morning and then, you know, and then, and then I just saw him again. Uh, then he had a kid and then he just sort of dropped out of the movement, right. sort of. But I saw there was a bit of a, Glenn Allen's do, you know, mm -hmm. has been doing a right. great job at Toronto Dollar. He had this event with Tom, um, Tom Greco, who was the guy oh, that wrote the book, okay. yeah, yeah. and Sut came because 
Glenn invited all the people involved in the currency movement in Toronto to, to mm-hmm. this dinner at the Hot House, right in your neighborhood. Yes. And Sut was there, and I said, and I hadn't seen him like in like not twenty years, but maybe fifteen years. Should get him and on it the was, show. Uh, it, was, it was great to see him and hang out. Yeah. It'd be nice to talk about. But it's funny. Your story is interesting from childhood because look at the stuff that you care about and are interested in now. Like it's led to this point where talking about alternative currency and how it all works and what to do is important especially depending on where you stand so Mm -hmm. it's a good story and we need a new currency because uh, the global financial system is in turmoil Mm -hmm. and uh, what was it last week where we saw these guys uh, that are saying that guys like Tim Geithner and these basically the people that Mm -hmm. are running the US financial system they put up that the the Treasury Secretary position up for auction and I'm quoting the guy Mm-hmm. Basically, that Goldman Sachs had the highest bid, and mm-hmm. Mark Carney in Canada. I don't know if he's a good guy or not. Uh, and now he's going off to some international position, but he's a Goldman Sachs guy too. Even if he was born in Hay River, Northwest Territories. Good guy or not, sometimes it's not even the case, right? It's like, what? Yeah. You know, we've been talking about a lot of this stuff. I don't even know what to say anymore. Like, even today's one of those days I feel a little bit defeated. No, that's not maybe the word, but it's just like, meh, I don't really care as much today because I'm, like, tired of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I just have to regroup, then I'll be back in it. But unless if you're participating, often we're just watching to see what happens, which I, you know, which is why I'm always pushing this, like, currency stuff and, Mm -hmm. like, change where, you know, change comes from those people who truly understand, believe, and who are going to execute. You know, mm-hmm. and I think a lot of people trying to make change that, unfortunately, I feel like they join things they don't fully understand, or it's just for the sake of it. Mm-hmm. And I would like to see more action from those who do understand and who want to make a difference and keep moving forward no matter what. You know? Yeah. yeah. Well, well, that's what we're doing here at that channel. That's right. With our scientists yeah. working in the basement on stuff like this, <laughs> which I can't talk about. I know, no. See, no one knows what's on the sheet of paper. I want to, I want to share it, but he won't let me. <laughs> in time, people. In yeah. time, we yeah. will share. But I think it's great. This is, you know, and you know, I have your back on this. As soon as things are moving, I'm there. Okay. So, awesome. Very cool. Yeah. Um, why don't actually? I got a video that's going to kind mm-hmm. of punctuate what we're talking about here. Right. But let's just before we watch this, you got that? Is that ready to go, uh, Aaron? I sent the you other video. Aaron. <laughs> oh, yeah. I sent you a video. Uh, can you give me a thumbs up when that's ready to go? Okay, so still working on that. Mm-hmm. Um, Francoise Soria will, is here. She's, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, tomorrow, is it? World Philosophy Day? So, um, yes, World Philosophy Day. It's tomorrow. Plato. Plato's mm-hmm. Myth of the Cave. You know, I'm some very people's... intrigued. Yep. Are you? Yes. So we're going to talk to Francoise all about that in just a couple of minutes. It's going to be good. Plato, of course, he was the one that said it about Atlantis, right? Yes, and I was so into that for a while. That's why I'm like, cool, yeah. I'd like to hear more. Yeah. And uh, Braz Men and uh, how do you say that? Menezes. Menezes. Is Menezes, coming in. And yeah. He's uh, got something called Matata Trilogy. That's what that is. Yeah, Matata Trilogy. To make out your writing. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. And uh, also Diane St. John will be here. She's the executive director of, uh, of business development for the Canadian Unity Travel Club. So that's interesting. Awesome. Yeah. Um, I guess we're still waiting for that video. So we have to talk about other stuff. I should Aaron. talk about traveling because I'm dying to travel. Really? Where do you yes. want to go to? I am so easy. I just want to see lots of things. So even if there are certain areas, I think right now Prue's calling me and it never used to. I'd like Uh to go, but I'm one of those people. If I have the opportunity, I'll be like, I'll go. It really makes no difference. See, that's what, that's the way I approach life. Yeah. I I don't really have a big uh, yearning to travel. (sighs) Yeah. I know it's weird, but every once in a while a trip gets put right in front of me. I can take it or not. Do you take it? I hope you Sometimes do. I do. Yeah. Sometimes I don't. I mean... Depends. I mean, life life stuff, right? Yeah. So, I've been very... Uh, anyway, I've seen a few places. been very fortunate mm-hmm. and uh, happy to take... I don't like... The, you know, the more I think about it, though, I don't like traveling by air. And I don't love it. Especially with all the searching that they're doing, the x-ray and all that stuff right. that they're doing. You know, sorry. Go away. I don't like it at all, but it really seems like that's the only way right now to get to the places I want to get, unless if I 
figure out some bizarre routes, which mm -hmm. is, you know, in our everyday life, it's usually not an option. People don't usually have the time or the finances or the resources. I don't enjoy flying, but guess what? It gets me where I want to go, so I got to suck it up. Yeah. Well, we had one guy who actually co-hosted with me. Mm -hmm. He rode his bike from, I think, London or Paris mm -hmm. to Japan. Awesome. Can you imagine? Yes, I think that's great. Yeah. I think it's crazy. It's not my thing, but... It's pretty cool hearing those stories. It's motivational, <laughs> you know? Yeah. <laughs> like, you know, sometimes I don't want to get out of bed and go upstairs to the kitchen to get a glass of water. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we got the video ready to go. This is Louis Farrakhan, the reverend. I thought he was a Muslim. But anyways, it's uh, Louis Farrakhan, and uh -huh. uh, we're going to watch this. We're going to come back, and then we're going to get Francoise on the show. So let's watch this, and, and we'll come back and chat briefly about it. Assistant uh, to... Uh, Rumsfeld. Turn it up just a bit there, please. I can't call his name. Pearl. Who? Pearl. No, not not Pearl. Wolfowitz. Oh, Wolfowitz, yeah. yeah. Wolfowitz. Hold your point, Mister. We got to go to a top of the hour break. That that's the kind of information though that I wanted you to give us. Carolina High School were injured today when a chemistry experiment sparked that's an great. explosion. That's good. Hazmat crews are still on the scene. A nurse who worked for Michael Jackson took the There's so many people who don't Dr. know that. Today. And they don't know it because the media is bought and paid for. This is a hell of a, a betrayal of the American people when you will not tell them the truth because you're afraid that if you tell the truth, your bosses will take your job from you. That's a hell of a thing. You don't have a democracy when you don't have a free press. You're all slaves and you love it. So you deserve what you get the erosion of your democracy. You'll soon be the laughing stock of the world. That works out to less than 50 cents a It's a damn shame. That's why the children are occupying space in New York, in Boston, in Washington, in Chicago, in San Francisco, in other cities. Why? Because they're not looking to you as a source of information for them. Look how long it took you all to talk about what was going on in New York. It took you two weeks because the same people that controlled the banks controlled the media. You all know it, but you're afraid to say it. But God put it on Farrakhan to say it for you. And maybe one day you'll get some courage to stand up and give America free media a real free fourth estate. But right now, you ain't even worth the time of day. Local news headlines, traffic and weather up next on WBOF. I'm glad. Hell, I'm not hiding nothing. <laughs> you need somebody to tell the truth. You need somebody that's not afraid to die for the truth that you could be made free. Because you're not free. And you don't really know what it means to really be a free white person, a free black person, a free Mexican, a free Arab. If you're afraid to tell the truth, what future does your children have in a society where truth is brushed to the curb? I thank God for the young man uh, that invented this wonderful technology. Steve Jobs. Yeah. Steve Jobs. That's the man that's freeing the whole planet where Zbigniew Brzezinski could say yesterday it was easier to control a million people than to kill a million people. Then now he says it's easier to kill a million people than to control a million people because the genie is out of the box, the cat is out of the bag, the people all over the world are waking up and you need to wake up and free America. Then you'll have a future and your children will have a future. But if you're afraid, afraid for what? You're going to die anyway. Right. Where can you run to escape death? Yeah. If you love America, 
than fight for America to be free. Yeah, mm. I know. It's probably nothing. Nothing? Yes, she sir. might, I don't know. Like, I, I, I'm not in the good, no, the best good. mood, I'm no, brother. Yeah, I, I know you're. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> great. You're yeah. in a great mood. That's right. Stop. No, no, I'm That's fine. Right. Right. Thank you. You can turn yes. top of the hours in a way or get a minister like that. You know what you're doing with that. So yes, sir, brother. I know. You're right. You're right. And I believe you're moving and I just pretty exactly. I'm not only hurting okay. for Gaddafi. Yeah. I'm hurting for us. Okay. That yeah. thing, who let the dogs out? Good point. Thank you. What has just been done has let the dogs of destruction out. This message brought to you by the American Stroke Association and the Ad Council. Yeah, I think that was uh, done just after the death of, uh, or the reported death, who knows what's really going on, of mm -hmm. Gaddafi. Okay, yeah. And uh, so, anyway, that's pretty awesome. And, uh, you know, I, I, I used to not be a huge fan of Louis Farrakhan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, a little too militant sometimes, maybe even bordering on racist. But uh, yeah. at yeah. least that's my perception. His but, delivery but may not him work there, for, yeah. You know, hey, he sounded like Martin Luther King there. I, I think, I mean, I get the point. Like I said, the delivery may not work for everybody, but, you know, he's got some valid points there. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so we say. <laughs> well, what did you want to talk? You wanted to mention about the Occupy, because they're going to be booting out the Occupy um, people in Toronto, and they're in your neighborhood, right? Yeah, so the helicopter's been hovering for two days, as always. Nice. But uh, it was interesting. It was something that I was talking to someone about, but you know the fact that they chose occupy as the name and how that's really like a military term yeah and going back it's more like a sexual term so it was just it interest is? yeah it was interesting that that's um what was chosen but you know we'll see what happens i just really kind of am ignoring it i'm just gonna wait to see what happens for me it's a little silly at this point i would but I the get, whole thing is silly um no not the whole thing i think maybe i can't really speak for every place i mean i understand and kind of support the foundation of what's going on. We've talked about all of this. I don't really need to expand on it. It's just uh, what's happening here or other places. I'm hoping that maybe selected people within the groups that are very serious and hardcore can step back and start something that's going to be a lot more uh, powerful and maybe do it in a way that you know the police don't need to get involved or be able to interrupt, but there will be ongoing gatherings or talks or education where people can figure out what we can really do. At this point, it's just stretched out to be something I can't take too seriously. Okay, you know what? Uh, I've. By the way, did you see see that movie Thrive yet? Mm -mm. Thrive. Uh, yeah, I'll write it I'll down. I'll send it to you. I got a link okay. to it where you can see the whole thing online. Cool. But I saw it at Oasey. It was uh, there were two showings uh, that I know of. Uh, Friday night, one at Oasey, one at the Alternative Thinking mm -hmm. Bookstore. Okay. And it was awesome. It's a it's a movie that tries to put all the problems mm -hmm. together into perspective and then tries to come up with a solution. One of the solutions that I've always advocated is that, you know, let the revolution be a business. In fact, let it be an awesomely successful business. Because you got to get from here to there. Right. And that's often the difficulty. Because I think the Occupy people, um, you know, for the most part, they're young. Mm -hmm. For the most part, probably not business people. Yep. And, you know, what business does, it, it's a discipline that allows you to mm -hmm. create something that can be uh, sustainable in the world, yep. right? And that's what the movement needs to be. You know what, I completely agree with you and that's part of the problem. Nobody wants to, like again, lead, no leader, no system, and everyone kind of speaking their mind, you're not getting anywhere. Yeah. There's always a business foundation that's required in a lot of things that you're doing mm -hmm. and it's not a negative, it's how you use it. It's like technology, technology's not a negative thing, it's how we use it. Yeah. So, I mean, we'll see, we'll see what happens, just watching as usual. Okay. Yeah. Good. So why don't we take a little break and we'll come back with Francoise uh, right after this. We're going to be talking about World Philosophy Day, Plato's Myth of the Cave, and maybe some other stuff. And mm -hmm. we're just going to have a great conversation. Yes. We're going to play some music from this group, The Distillery, right now. Uh, they sent us this disc and uh, we're going to listen to it right now. Cool. We'll come back with Francoise Soria from uh, New Acropolis right after this here on Liquid Lunch. You had to say, but you never felt more far away. Out of sight. And out of mind, my baby left me far behind. Now's my turn to make you see. Ain't ever getting no loving from me. Tell me lies and tell me. 
tell me truths, but make your mind what you wanna do. I never liked you anyway. All right, we're back on the air. Oops, you got us mid-conversation. Yeah, it's always um, the off-camera conversation. Yeah, it's too bad we should have that conversation on the air. Yes. Maybe later in the show. Maybe yes. one of our guests won't show up, and then we can do that. But yes. uh, w our first guest did show up. Francoise Soria is here. Welcome. Francoise, always great to have you on the show. Thank you. It's always great to be here, to <laughs> see the studio. Very beautiful. So. And look, you got Toronto behind you. You see? Yes, I noticed. Yes. That's yeah. great. Yeah. yeah. We, so, the, um, we feel the vibe of the city. That's exactly. Yes. Yeah. So um, now, now you're from the new Acropolis. Yes, I'm uh, the director of the association here in Toronto. Mm -hmm. It's called the New Acropolis, indeed. And uh, tomorrow is a big day for us. It's a symbolic day because for us, uh, every day is Philosophy Day. Right. However, uh, tomorrow, which is November 17, is the World Philosophy Day as proclaimed by the United Nations, mm -hmm. and particularly the UNESCO. So the United Nations uh, Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization. Mm -hmm. uh, very few people know about uh, this day, and yet it's very important. Mm. Yeah, I think that philosophy really doesn't get enough proper respect 
these days. Yeah, that's true, and it's uh, paradoxical because at the same time there is uh, a growing need for it. And that's why, you know, I brought those, uh, like those quotes from the United Nations because I found that they are very important like, to yeah. understand what philosophy is. Because it's true that a lot of people have like, misconceptions, like, mm -hmm. you know, like uh, pejorative ideas about uh, philosophy. They think that it's, uh, you know, abstractions that are absolutely not relevant to life. And yet it is so relevant. But I really like, you know, the UNESCO's uh, constitution, like the, their first sentence is, since wars begin in the minds of men, it is in the minds of men that the defenses of peace must be constructed. You know, the way we think mm -hmm. forms our lives and, and our societies. Who said that? So it is the first clause in the preamble of the UNESCO's constitution. It was written in 1945. Yeah. And it, it is really like timeless wisdom. Right. That's uh, really timeless wisdom. And then in 2002, this mm -hmm. is when the first World Philosophy Day, you know, uh, was uh, presented. And uh, it was presented as the celebration of wisdom and reflection, bringing together people of all ages around the school of freedom that is philosophy. Philosophy being a school of freedom, that's wonderful. You know, like mm -hmm. the, the video right. that you showed before, it's uh, also very powerful. Because everything starts in the way we think, you know, in the way we manage ourselves. But all starts, you know, in uh, in really like the the right. way we uh, we think and we think for ourselves. And philosophy is really about uh, learning to think well, and that's to say to think with intelligence. Right. right? It's a great uh, great yeah. point. And uh, I remember just so you, uh, just my my little story. I because I, I went to university. I took business. Mm -hmm. Okay, Me too. At, at university. I took really? In university. Where did yes. you go? Well, it was in France at oh. the time, uh, but I studied business. Yeah. Okay. And that's uh, interesting because, as you said, and as we see with Plato, like business is a, a tool, is a means. Yeah. You know, our societies get sick when business becomes the goal, the purpose, when money becomes the ultimate goal of life. Whereas business can be a healthy management of resources. Absolutely, right. as we were saying, yeah. you know, the revolution, if we need one, should be a business. Right? Yeah, but well, business is an organization, so we need organization to exactly. manifest ideas, exactly. right? Exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. But, but when I was in, in school, there was mm -hmm. sort of a, uh, sort of the, the zeitgeist uh, of the business students was like, you know, they'd look at the philosophy students or the music students and kind of dismiss them as mm -hmm. being, um, you know, airy-fairy, abstract, mm -hmm. not, not mm -hmm. practical, not, not things worthwhile to study yeah. but if we look mm -hmm. at um, what was done I mean the tradition of education especially in Britain where they would train the best and the brightest would have a background in philosophy mm -hmm. first right mm -hmm. the classics mm -hmm. and they would understand history and they would understand the origins of our culture and then mm -hmm. be able to do whatever they did in life whether they went into the military or whether mm -hmm. they went into business or government they would bring that understanding with them and it seems to me that you know, uh, often we're losing that, and we're yeah. not teaching. Mm -hmm. uh, like just a just a crazy example, and this may sound unbelievable. I was, you know, last time I had a job was um, we were having a meeting, just a meeting about something, and I had some younger people in this meeting with me, and I I referenced just as a reference the Tower of Bab Babel mm -hmm. as a metaphor or something, mm -hmm. right? And they didn't know what it was. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, so in a sense, that's uh, an in inability to communicate because of a, a lack of understanding of a, an essential yeah. cultural reference. Yeah, and, and you know, like what you say is interesting because uh, indeed uh, philosophy, in a way, it's uh, understandable that it doesn't have like a very, uh, uh, you know, positive image because it has become in many ways like a dry exercise and yet on philosophy in its essence and this is how we revive it at New Acropolis in 56 countries in the world mm -hmm. has everything to do with the human and it is about developing the being and uh, and that's why philosophy is not even like a discipline in itself and philosophy in a classical manner as we call it because it applies to life in fact uh, includes uh, science art uh, sociopolitics you know uh, spirituality and this is uh, those facets of, of society 
that uh, together can form uh, communities, you know, driven by wisdom, driven by uh, uh, those ideals, you know, that are at the center of philosophy. So it's too bad that today we have like this war, you know, and this uh, form of exclusion between the different, uh, you know, like disciplines or fields of knowledge or fields of activity. But yet, you know, those fields, they should, they could, you know, converge like towards uh, like a central uh, purpose and that could be the fulfillment of the human being. This is truly the message here, what we talk about of the, uh, the myth of the cave of Plato. And that's it, it's too bad that uh, philosophy has become isolated as a dry field of knowledge that is useless because in many ways it's true that it has become useless. We need to revive you know, the, the true quest for wisdom, the quest for beauty, you know, this, uh, but uh, when I say a quest, it's as a way of living, you know, it's every day to feel this uh, tension, you know, towards uh, that which is higher than ourselves, you know, towards dignity, towards beauty, towards goodness, towards justice, towards uh, that which is true, you know, but this is demanding, it creates a tension, because, mm -hmm. you know, just before, uh, when you were, you were talking about when you, you know, you feel a bit uh, <laughs> defeated and say, well, you know, when, when we understand, it's good to go into action. Right. And that's, uh, that's uh, you know, the process of philosophy that we're talking about when, you know, like we understand a little bit more what beauty is because we find it inside us. When we understand a bit more what truth, what justice is, thanks to this process of, uh, of, of study, reflection, discernment. But then, uh, you know, we want to put it into action. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why philosophy is action. Mm -hmm. It is to act, to bring into the world those archetypes or those ideals, you know, that are the center of, of wisdom. Mm -hmm. And this is how the world can change. Right. In fact, the true revolution, uh, you know, happens in the human being. You know, it is the, those human beings who, who desire, you know, more than just survival. Uh, and that, that's really the, uh, the message of the myth of the cave. And at the center is education. And as you said here, it's like a, an education of the being. You know, to, today we are so obsessed by the doing, mm -hmm. you know, doing, the having, you know. And uh, we forget what is at the center and that is the being. Because, you know, if we change as human beings, the way we do things changes also, right? right? And that's too bad that we are neglecting so badly, you know, the education of the being, which is philosophy in a classical manner. It's transformative, it's transformational. Mm -hmm. If we want to transform the world, we need to transform ourselves. Absolutely, and we mm -hmm. kind of went there last week. We right. have to start at home with all our own actions yes. as an individual, mm -hmm. and that's the only way we're gonna be able to move out and make a difference. Well, it's sure, like, how can we build a world of solidarity, of fraternity, mm -hmm. if we have, uh, you know, like a problem, you know, living with people around us, you know, if we are rude or disrespectful, you know, with people we meet on the street, in the supermarket, in the bank, mm -hmm. there's a contradiction. Also, right. yes, if we are truly in love with justice, not necessarily, um, we'll have to look within and look, you know, what is unjust in us. And that's why Plato said, you know, if we want justice in society, mm -hmm. justice has to reside in the heart and the soul of each human being. Like we cannot demand society to give us something, you know, as a collective, mm -hmm. but also as individuals that does not exist in us, you know. Right. If we are uh, dreaming of a world with justice, we also necessarily need to ask ourselves, but what is justice? And what does it mean, justice for the human being? And what uh, you know, we learn with uh, philosophy, with Plato, justice in the human being is to put the being first, is to have our, you know, like the instincts, and what uh, Plato calls the appetites, you mm -hmm. know, uh, of the personality, and that's to say the emotions, the desires, uh, the egoistic desires, and like fears, uh, driven mm -hmm. by intelligence, wisdom, and this is not easy. I mean, intellectually, we can all agree and say, yeah, that's nice, you mm -hmm. know, that's beautiful. But you know, in everyday action, how many times our fears take control? How many times impatience takes control? Yeah. How many times uh, egoism takes control? Mm -hmm. And our beautiful dreams uh, are under the carpet. 
you know, for cotton. You know? Absolutely. And uh, so it takes an education to, uh, you know, like to learn how to drive, how mm -hmm. to drive those uh, wide horses. You know, like uh, I like the allegory that uh, Plato uses, mm -hmm. you know, the chariot, uh, where the charioteer is uh, intelligence. Mm -hmm. And there are two uh, horses, the horses of uh, the intellect and the horse, the horse of the intellect and the horse of the uh, passions, and that's mm -hmm. to say the desires, emotions. And, um, you know, wisdom is when intelligence drives desires. And the problem is when the desires are driven by the intellect mm -hmm. you know, that rationalizes the most egoistic choices of life. You know? Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, that seems about right, as was. Yeah. That's really well put, and it's always one of those um, yeah. reminders that we need. And we're often, like, like you said, we're running around. We're also just reacting. Mm -hmm. There's no, yeah. Why are you always grinning at me? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not grinning at you, Aaron. I'm just grinning. Okay. <laughs> Okay, Francois. So tomorrow's World Philosophy Day, and um, and you guys are doing. It's so great that you guys are here in Toronto and in other cities across Canada mm -hmm. and countries around the world because you're bringing yes. philosophy to the public attention, right? And mm -hmm. and tomorrow and so is UNESCO with uh, World Philosophy Day tomorrow, and mm -hmm. you guys are are putting on an event mm -hmm. uh, as part of this, right? Um, yeah. Do you want to tell us a little bit? Yeah, for us, it's, uh, of course, it's very important to, to respond, you know, to this call uh, from the United Nations. As I said, like for us, it's uh, very symbolic because mm -hmm. New Acropolis has been uh, adhering to those principles, you know, put uh, forth by the United Nations like since uh, 1957. So it means like 54 years uh, already, you know, mm -hmm. of constant action all over the world, putting philosophy to life into action for our community. So, uh, so yes, so we've responded always positively to this call. And tomorrow in Toronto, uh, we're going to have a special event mm -hmm. at the Center for Social Innovation. And okay. that is uh, going to be at 7.30. It's a Center for Social Innovation uh, on Spadina. Uh, Boy, I went to one of your events there before. Remember? Yes, of course. You were, you were there for Pierre Poulin's uh, photography. Yeah. Launching that, that was, was great. great. We have it was a uh, lot great of pictures of you. <laughs> yeah, well, yes, it a, yes. It was a really nice event. Yeah, Are you, yeah. Is there, is, very is, inspiring. Is, now, yes. is tomorrow's event going to be every bit as much fun as that? Sorry, is it going to be as much fun? Yes, tomorrow? absolutely, absolutely. Because uh, it's going to be uh, interactive. We're going to show some movie clips. You know, okay. uh, for instance, uh, there is uh, a modern rendition of uh, the cave and that is uh, the matrix i know it's an old movie mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, from our experience you know right. in our in our philosophy workshops at Neacropolis, like all our students have seen the matrix yeah. like, this mm -hmm. is a, a classic of course we're talking of the first one not yeah. the second yeah. and not the, the third. second one no. but uh, th they are Definitely. like you know like in the, the matrix there are key moments that mm -hmm. are very uh, very strong and so we're going to to show movie clips, we're going to have uh, different philosophers of mm -hmm. our association, we're going to, uh, uh, to talk, uh, we're going to have interaction with the public, so it's going to be a very dynamic uh, mm -hmm. evening, and um, that's at 7.30. The address is uh, 215 Spadina Avenue. 215, 215? Yeah, it's not far from here. It, no. 215 Spadina Avenue. And I walked there the last time. You from see? here. But you mm -hmm. see? I told with you. With my friend Daryl. You see? Whose yes. birthday it is today. <laughs> Happy birthday, Daryl. <laughs> Happy birthday, Daryl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, uh, so, yes, that's... Uh, and, you know, like in Canada, on uh, Friday, we're going to have uh, uh, an event also related to Plato in uh, Montreal as well. Mm -hmm. You know, with Denis. You've met Denis Brickney, yeah. the National Director of uh, Canada, New Acropolis, Canada. So that's going to be Friday? Yeah, Friday. So if you'd like to go to Montreal, if you understand French, uh, you oh, can so go there. Oh, so it's going to be in French in Montreal. Uh -huh. Are you going uh, no, for that? No, no. I bet I'm you wish. You could. Oh, I, I, how did you guess? <laughs> <laughs> yes, if I could fly there, I would. Uh, and then in Ottawa, our mm -hmm. city in Ottawa also is going to do uh, something on Friday. Mm -hmm. uh, and I can tell you that all our centers all over the world, they uh, this week is super active and dynamic because uh, everybody is doing special events to celebrate. Uh, mm -hmm. As I said, it's symbolic because every day for us, we are involved in uh, bringing to life those uh, very important uh, values, mm -hmm. such as uh, justice, goodness, uh, beauty um, in our communities. And that mm -hmm. takes, uh, you know, like a true commitment mm -hmm. to the being, to the human being. Um, it's 
amazing. Mm -hmm. So is it all going to be Plato all over the world or? No, 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 no. Like each uh, country, each uh, city is uh, organizing different uh, kind of events. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, I invite you to go to our international website because you're going to see lots of news about that. It's uh, acropolis.org. That's the international website. Okay. And there you have even uh, like news that are posted on a regular mm -hmm. basis about what's going on. And in Canada, our website is newacropolis.ca. And this is where you'll find the, our three cities or uh, activities advertised. That's great. And how, how late does the evening go? Because it's interactive and you yeah. guys seem to have a lot <laughs> going on. So um, generally it's about two hours, like 9.30, okay. but uh, realistically it's 10. Okay. <laughs> because very often people, you know, stay behind sure. and there are discussions. So, uh, you know, it's between 9.30 and 10. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. that sounds like fun. That does sound so like that's fun. Uh, yes. tomorrow, uh, which is Thursday. You should go and I'll I'm, live through you. I'm just trying <laughs> to... Um, I should get one of those... Uh, Glass, uh, glasses that has HD camera, <laughs> and then you can just tune in and, and see what I see. That would I be see. awesome. That would be <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, um. So let's talk a little bit about Plato and the um, the, the myth of the cave, mm -hmm. because um, it, it seems to be one of the classic Plato uh, things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a very strong uh, myth, uh, and what I would like to say about myths is that, uh, like to us, myths are stories that don't exist, right? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. However, myth means uh, you know the word that speaks the truth, like in Greek. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting that uh, with Plato's uh, myth of the cave, we are in presence with um, a, a teaching of mm -hmm. wisdom that is telling us about uh, different levels of consciousness mm -hmm. right? and uh, levels of consciousness that are higher than our current one. And so it's a story that is telling us about the human journey, that's to say the possibility, and I would say even the duty of mm -hmm. the human being to evolve, that's to say to develop intelligence, to develop uh, spiritual mm -hmm. uh, inner powers. Right? And that's why the, this uh, story is far from being a little story, you know, like to entertain, but it has very profound truth mm -hmm. because Plato is delivering a message that is about uh, uh, education that is transformational, which is called uh, in uh, spirituality initiation. Like mm -hmm. it's a pedagogy that is uh, initiatic, initiatic, initiatic pedagogy. Right. That's to say uh, an education where the being awakes mm -hmm. and uh, and is born uh, to new levels of reality. And what Plato describes in the cave is this uh, state of being where uh, we are trapped you know, by habits, we are trapped by uh, an identification with the materiality of life. You know, mm -hmm. We are trapped by uh, uh, even a culture you know, that reduces us you know, to robots, to machines. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and here we are, uh, playing, uh, crying, uh, moving all over the place, but in, in a cave, you know? And in the cave there are uh, forms moving, mm -hmm. and th these are uh, um, you know, like objects huh, that, uh, yeah. that we see, uh, only the, the reflections, like the shadows of, of that, and that is what we take for reality. And uh, this is, a, you know, like a world uh, of, of lies. This is a world, uh, you know, governed by, by fear, mm -hmm. or by, uh, uh, you know, like the, the, the limits uh, of, uh, of our personalities and above all, uh, uh, by this search for comfort. The cave is that. It's like this lifestyle, you mm -hmm. know, that is dictated by comfort, you know, like uh, not only physical comfort, but uh, psychological, mental. Mm -hmm. And if we just give in, you know, to this force, we become lazier and lazier. So we, you know, we, we think less and less for ourselves. We are buying uh, everything, like you know, rationally. You know, like mm -hmm. uh, we are precisely what you know, like you talked about before, like the media you know, that can be so superficial. Like it's like no true critical thinking, you know, true judgment, mm -hmm. and we end up falling completely asleep, you mm -hmm. know, and living life like. Uh, not really as living beings, you know, with aspirations that are of a more human and spiritual nature, but mm -hmm. like robots, conditioned yeah. by society. And, and Plato is telling us about this process of awakening and having the courage to live our destiny of human beings. Mm -hmm. you know? And this is really what is, what is philosophy you know, in the classical manner, to little by little progressively realize you know, this uh, human identity. 
things and you know like for the ones who feel that they are more than a biological reality that mm -hmm. they are a being that they are an essence right? and that they would they want you know, to develop this essence they want to conquer the being you know and that's uh, that's why uh, Plato's myth is uh, very powerful and very current you know it's mm -hmm. far from being something that belongs to the past in fact we are in presence of a visionary you right. know like the, the teachings contained in this myth are telling us about the future about uh, who we can and we ought to become mm -hmm. as humanity because we are not meant you know like to be just in a survival mode and fighting against each other and no we are meant to be um, human beings uh, in evolution evolving you know so it's inspiring wow. so well put <laughs> Okay, Francois, so what's yeah. going to happen in 2012? Are we going to get that galactic thing from the center of the galaxy and <laughs> go to well, fifth density? Well, 2012, it's going to snow in January, as <laughs> Denis told you already. So. <laughs> I forgot. That's funny. Yeah. But uh, a good news, Hugh, is that uh, Denis is coming back to Toronto in January uh, 2012, if we are uh, let's, still alive. Let's yes. do it. Let's bring him to the show, okay? Yes. And we can show. We'll have the. You, we'll, we'll show the Bay Street behind, and if it's snowing that day, then people can see the snow. You and then you can tell Denis Bricknay is uh, really a magician. He's uh, a seer uh, <laughs> because he had predicted it. Uh. <laughs> That's what happens when uh -huh. you learn philosophy and use it mm -hmm. in your everyday life, right? <laughs> yeah, we develop. Uh, Common sense. There you go. <laughs> there you, go. <laughs> you know, well, I just, uh, and we're going to give everybody the details about how to come mm -hmm. to the event. So I, I wanted to say, though, the, another real practical thing about philosophy, one of the things you learn when you take philosophy in the 101 is logic, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. You learn how to think so. logically. And, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes it frustrates me when I'm having a debate with someone mm -hmm. and they are just, like, they're not, they're making logical mistakes and I'm mm -hmm. going, how can I have a debate with this person <laughs> when they can't even yeah. think logically? And, and logic is developed through, you know, like developing our mental ability mm -hmm. to think, yeah. but also through experience. Because a lot of uh, illogical thinking comes from uh, being completely disconnected mm -hmm. from life, from reality. And so it's easy in the mind, everything becomes possible. That's why we need uh, this constant application of ideas because then we have a return, a feedback. The feedback. Mm -hmm. And this is how you develop logic, yeah. you know, because sure. you have constantly the feedback of life. And as we've said already, this is one of the most practical things you can do. If you want to have a revolution, if you want to run a business, really, you've got, this is essential stuff. And yeah. uh, unfortunately, our schools aren't making it mandatory. Mm -hmm. So who should come to this event tomorrow, Francoise? Everybody who feels that, uh, you know, there are more than uh, things, <laughs> than right. objects. Everybody who feels a little uh, or very, you know, uncomfortable looking at our world today mm -hmm. because it's very uh, sociopolitical what we're going to talk about. Mm -hmm. It's about the state of the world. Uh, anybody who feels like, as Neo says in the Matrix, there's something wrong with the yeah. world. There's something wrong with the, the way we are living today. There's something wrong with, uh, you know, this movie that is pulled in front of our eyes yeah. as if it was truth. Mm -hmm. So anybody who feels that there's more, you know, to life, there's more to the human being than what we are pulled in front of our eyes every day mm -hmm. is welcome to join us. It's going to be, a, you know, uplifting and uh, maybe mind-bugging <laughs> uh, event, but um, certainly useful to yeah. enrich uh, our community. It's important to lift a little bit the level, right, of, uh, it of our, our city. Yeah. Yeah. It, it does, because I think we all want get to get outside of our everyday routines and, you know. Well, this is something that. to do tomorrow night. If you're not yeah. doing anything, you're going to meet a great bunch of people, yeah. and uh, you're going to have a lot of fun, and mm -hmm. um, and it's at 215 Spadina, 730. Is there any mm -hmm. admission charge or anything? Yes, there is. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, $15 for students and 25 regular price. Okay. Is Lorinda going to be waiting for people when they walk in the front door so she can send them up to the right floor? Yes, yes, there's going to be Lorinda, there's going to be uh, Suyong. All our team uh, is going to be there with their big smile. Oh, yes. that, that's great. And what I would like to say, yes. though, is that all of us, we are volunteers. Mm -hmm. and like, if we charge mm -hmm. costs, it's really to pay for the bills well, of the association. We are a non-profit association. All of us, we are volunteers. It's well, a labor of love. <laughs> there's probably going to be snacks and, and yeah. refreshments, and there were mm -hmm. the last time. And it was an awesome event. And uh, mm -hmm. so, you know something to do tomorrow night.
That's a great well, thing to do tomorrow night. Yes, so thank you. Thank you, Francoise, for thank coming you, in today. Newacropolis.ca. Yeah, newacropolis.ca is our Canadian website. Right. This is where you're going to have all the information about the event. So people can go on that website. There, there it is right there. And they can sign up and become, you know, get involved with you guys. And whether you're in Toronto or Montreal or Ottawa, yeah. they can get involved, right? Absolutely. And all over the world, we are there in 56 countries. Okay. Yeah. All right, Francoise. Always Thank you. Thank you. so much fun to I have you. I wish we had more time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> well, I can come back. <laughs> okay. That'd be great. So let's yeah. uh, take a little break, uh, Aaron. We're going to come back with uh, Braz mm. Menezes. Mm. Yes. <laughs> he'll, he'll correct my uh, pronunciation. Yes. Uh, and we're going to be talking about the Matata Trilogy. So let's take the break, and we'll be right back. Liquid Lunch is mm. continuing on Wednesday. We'll be right back. But you never felt more far away Out of sight and out of mind My baby left me far behind Now's my turn to make you see Ain't ever getting no loving from me
Here. Oh, I'm reading. I'm reading this, uh, Just Matata, mm -hmm. Since Saints and Settlers, a novel set in Goa and Kenya, and we have the author Braz Menezes here. That's pretty good. Great not, to have you not here. many people pronounce it right first time. Well, it wasn't my first time, and I'm still not sure I got it right, and I'm not <laughs> sure I'll get it right the next time. But uh, anyway, great to have you here. Great to meet you. And uh, you brought a few different things here today. You yes. Look at this thing. That's incredible. But not too closely. <laughs> you, know, it up you can look at it from a number of different angles. Yes. You see, it's got a number of different, but it's very unusual, and and we're fascinated with it, Braz. Uh, do you want to just let let us know what that is again? I mean, we know, but mm -hmm. I mean, we can talk about it in between. But I'll take you what, what this book is all about. But let me stop. You know, about a month ago, there was a book that came out about an eleven-year-old boy crossing the Indian Ocean in mm -hmm. 1950. It's a book that came out? Yeah, it was all over the press and things. This is uh, um, Ondaatje, Michael Ondaatje's book. Mm -hmm. Okay. The Catch Table. And that was released. And there was about an 11-year-old boy crossing the Indian Ocean in 1950. Okay. Now, absolute coincidence, this is about an Indian boy crossing the Indian Ocean, but in the opposite direction. Mm. And it came out last month. And this, now which direction does the boy go in your book? In my book, he goes from Africa mm -hmm. to Goa, to India. So he's going east, the other one was coming west. Okay. From Goa to? From uh, Sri Lanka to England. Mm -hmm. Did he go around the Horn or did he go up the Suez? No, I think he went up the Suez. Okay. Uh, and uh, this one went straight across. But the reason, uh, first, uh, Matata, do you know what Matata is? I don't know what it is. Matata, for those of you who saw The Lion King, will remember mm. it from Akuna Matata. Akuna means no Matata. Matata means trouble in Swahili. Mm -hmm. mm. So this means just trouble. Oh, and just And the book trouble. is written from the perspective of an 11-year-old mm -hmm. who is growing up and he is watching all this, he's listening to his granddad's stories and his folks, and he's watching this strange society that he lives in the community he lives in, which has come from Goa. They started to come in at the turn of the century. Goa was originally discovered by Vasco da Gama 500 years ago when they were all looking for spices and things. And Goa became the second most important city after Lisbon mm -hmm. during the peak of the Portuguese. And so after 400, 500 years, the culture changed and uh, they're very much Indian in stock but they're westernized. They spoke Portuguese and uh, other languages and at some point the Brits had to take over and look after Goa for a while when uh, one of the Portuguese kings took the wrong side and sided with Napoleon mm -hmm. and so the Brits decided this is not so good so they took over Goa and ran it for a few years. Mm -hmm. And uh, they discovered that the Goans really are pretty honest. They're so steeped in Catholicism, you can trust them with the cash. They are very loyal servants and things. So they started to take them to India, and from India to the colonies, which are still being established. And so I was one of that community. So you're, you were born in Kenya? I was born in Kenya of parents that came from Goa mm -hmm. right. to Africa. And we know that there's a lot of as you mentioned, you know that's the story of the British yeah. um, call, um, Empire. Yeah. You know they brought Indians yeah. Yeah. from and all over right. Kenya, East Africa, Wherever. Caribbean, yeah. all over. Yeah, and then um, in Kenya, because of the background, they gave them uh, intentionally or unintentionally jobs that were a bit more privileged. In other words, they were the number two and number three of the civil service. 
because this allowed the Brits with a relatively few people at the top to run a very large administration which mm -hmm. they needed mm -hmm. and so life went on it was a pretty interesting uh, experience but uh, the other side of the empire had its ugly side you know with the racial segregation and all those things we all went to racially segregated schools till 1955 and that was in Kenya in Kenya so uh, the book's a bit about this panorama of uh, living in different societies and different communities because uh, the Asian community were Catholic, partly Catholic. There were Hindus and Muslims, but all living in designated areas. So there was a Hindu area, a Muslim area? No, there was an Asian an area. Okay. In mm -hmm. fact, it wasn't even Asian. Asian is a new invention. It was all called India because India was part of the Raj and everybody was in India. Right. So uh, by about uh, the late 50s, or in 1960, in fact, things fell apart. But in 1947, when India became independent, presumably everybody has sought out who was Indian and who was Pakistani, right? Mm. And right. because they created this new country. But for Goa, they didn't have this problem because Goa continued Portugal, Portuguese for another 10 years beyond that. Oh, really? When did yeah. it become part of India? Uh, in 61. Okay. Uh, India became independent in 47. Right. But they couldn't call the, Portug the Goans Portuguese, although they're Portuguese mm -hmm. nationals, because then they would have to put them in a Portuguese box, mm -hmm. which would upset their whole racial balance. So everybody brown was called Asian at that point. Mm -hmm. Right. It's all very complicated, but it's no different from what happens today. <laughs> you know, you invent words to deal with the problem. But everybody lived happily and it was a good life. This book is a bit about that and it's about uh, a culture that uh, because it's steeped in religion, mm -hmm. the parents felt that they had to get their kids a Catholic education. There were no Catholic schools and eventually there was one, but it only dealt with primary schools. So anybody who had ambitions for their kids to do better than they did would pack them off to Goa, sometimes at the age of seven, mm -hmm. and send them across the ocean. Sometimes the mother would go three or four kids, and when the youngest was about 12, she would then come back to her spouse who continued working in Kenya. Mm -hmm. um, other times the kids would go off and be left with grandparents or uncles mm -hmm. or aunts sometime, who they had probably never met before in their lives and be brought up by these guys till they were 25 or 30. They do the boarding school and things because the Catholic schools in Kenya were reserved only for white Catholics. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a bit about this transition through all the segregation stuff happy moments and the things because everybody was happy they lived in their own little space and because they didn't know otherwise there was none of this discussion of equal rights and things mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, they led their lives they led their lives within the community and the communities really provided what today government has to provide in a sort of broader social support system and each community looked after its own interests, after its own education, and it helped its poor and helped the destitute and life mm -hmm. and on. Then the war, during the war, uh, different things happened. The Asian community was uh, divided rough, roughly with the Goans uh, more or less allocated to the civil service and white collar jobs. Uh, another group went into commerce and really built up the economy. Without them, Kenya would not have had an economy. They built, started off with shops in remote areas where nobody would deal with. And then they built the factories and mm -hmm. started to produce stuff and things. And another lot went into engineering and created the construction industry. Mm -hmm. Originally, a lot went out to schoolies, as you know, to build the railways, just like the Chinese were brought out to China, to mm -hmm. Canada. But uh, as the railways got completed, many stayed and then they went into other jobs and became part of a broader urban infrastructure mainly. During the war years, when things got very rough in England and in Europe, a lot of the white community had problems uh, coping because the banks wouldn't lend them money. In, in Britain? In Kenya. The, oh, in Kenya. Well, the okay. banks in Britain are frozen now. Right. 
so the settler community who were very uh, well they lived well but they were also pushed and uh, tight for cash they had no choice except borrow from their local shopkeeper who was usually an Indian uh, this guy had no other customers so he had no choice but to give them uh, loans they bought everything on credit and rent a ticker and at some point when they got cash they paid a bit and mm -hmm. life went on and they in turn borrowed from money lenders uh, using the same network that they had imported from India so that kept thing there's just a report somewhere in England about the role that the money lenders and then the shopkeepers played in keeping uh, Kenya solvent mm -hmm. uh, during much of the war years um, and so it goes on you know it's uh, mm -hmm. so I, um, the story deals with uh, this boy growing up and then at some point fighting and resisting this uh, idea of sending him to boarding school the boarding schools were of course run by Jesuits and they had their own discipline and they assumed and the, they boasted that you give us a child at seven and we'll give you a man at 21 or something but not everybody wanted or could adapt to a boarding school culture um, and the boarding schools were in Goa? In Goa. So they'd have to send them across the ocean for one across, thing and then yeah, deal yeah. with those the conditions yeah. there on the other. And part of it, uh, of the book, is an inside look uh, at uh, life in boarding school. Mm -hmm. well, one of the interesting side trips was the stopover in the Seychelles, which is about halfway from Goa to Kenya. The Seychelles is a group of islands mm -hmm. in the middle of nowhere. Uh, an archipelago and uh, for centuries certainly from the 15th 16th century um, when they were first discovered were used mainly by pirates to hide from each other at one time the Dutch were hiding from the Brits and then the mm -hmm. French were hiding from the Dutch and mm -hmm. the Brits were hiding from both sides at some stage and eventually moved hands from French to British, it's currently British, but it started off being French. And so that's a fascinating place with the culture of pirates and everything else. Mm -hmm. But from the eyes of a 11 year old boy who is listening to all these things and seeing this for the first time, everything is bigger than life. The islands are absolutely the sort of stuff you design on a computer, huge, like huge granite that sort of comes out of the ocean. Mm -hmm. Perfectly turquoise, beautiful turquoise green oceans. I wonder if we can get some pictures of the Seychelles. Oh, uh, beautiful. Uh, I'm just making a suggestion, but please yeah. carry on. I'm, I'm, I'm already there, yes. Braz, so. Yeah. No, no, absolutely fantastic. And then out of this granite and the uh, crevices between these huge uh, rocks mm -hmm. are palm trees and exotic plants, mm -hmm. leaves that are that, that much and I'm not exaggerating a meter across and things and every variety of it. Mm -hmm. and, and at one stage it was considered the Garden of Eden like every like lots of these places everybody thinks mm -hmm. this is the Garden of Eden this time right. and there are two things that uh, struck me there mm -hmm. first was the absolute splendor of it all and then a, a trip around the island with a tourist person who took us around mm -hmm. And the seeing a Coco de Mer for the first time, I had no idea what this was, right. and no, nobody else did. And that's what this thing is here. So yeah. exciting. Yeah. yeah. It's actually, uh, if you look at it, it's a double coconut. Mm -hmm. uh, this one's been cleaned up. It's been sliced. The flesh has been taken out. But outside here, there's a husk. And for practical purposes, it looks like a coconut, a deformed mm -hmm. coconut, but it's a double coconut. Right. And they grow on palms that are about 80 feet tall. Wow. And I think they flower once every, uh, or they fertilize one, mm -hmm. once every three years. The male of the species also is another tall tree and grows in a phallus, which is about three feet, a meter long, huh. covered with tiny, tiny, tiny flowers while it's in bloom. 
and then it pollinates the female and then poof drops off That's gone. amazing you know <laughs> yeah it's it's fascinating but i mean at 11 i couldn't understand all the details mm -hmm. the guy was explaining all this of course the tourists used to buy it and things the pirates used to and sailors used to grab this mm -hmm. these fish them off the sea and put them on the boat and take them to the far east and sell them for lots of money because it was believed that the inside of the fruit was had aphrodisiac qualities. Mm -hmm. We're looking at some pictures, by the way, of the Seychelles here. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's it. Yes, that's absolutely. Yeah, we want to go there right now. I yeah. want to go for about 15 years. One day. It will well, happen. Kate and William <laughs> were there on their honeymoon, as you know, recently. Yeah. Oh, really? When they disappeared and nobody knew where they were, I think that's where they were. Awesome. Yeah. Um, and so um, we then get back mm -hmm. and we go off to Goa. When I arrive in Goa, uh, which again is very tropical, but it actually it reminded me of the East African coast, the Mombasa and places like that, the tropical fruit, the mangoes, the coconuts mm -hmm. and things. And nice beaches. Nice beaches. And uh, the air, the air was strong with a very powerful smell. Mm -hmm. And uh, not a smell like uh, the Sierras or say some of these places you arrive at, but a perfumed smell. And my uncle explained that this was the cashew. Mm. You've all eaten cashew nuts, right? Yes. You grab a few you, and you chuck it and you don't think another mm -hmm. thought of it. But I brought you this because I think yes. it's fascinating. I don't know if you can this see this. Absolutely. Painting? Well, yeah, we're going to figure out how to... Uh, we yeah. forget to appreciate the... I don't um, know. Uh, oh, here we go. It's Brass, you, you might have to do you it better hold down. it up and then you Which can zoom around? in on There's it. your camera. Is that... Yeah. Uh, there we go. Does that show you anything? Yeah. yeah. So there we go. Well, I'll have to see this. Now, yeah. when the fr uh, flowers are out, yeah. mm -hmm. they just come out a bit like the apple blossom or the cherry blossom. They come out in a full brilliance all together and they stay on for just a short while and then they disappear. So you get the, all the fragrance of that. Mm -hmm. And then, from nowhere, you have something growing, and strangely, in this case, it's the seed that starts growing first. The nut starts mm -hmm. growing, and you see it growing, and then slowly, uh, what's, what is the shoot that connects the two becomes the fruit. It starts to swell, mm -hmm. and it becomes the fruit. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. But when it's absolutely ripe, you get to know it's right because mm -hmm. the air again smells of a different right. fragrance but also a very powerful fragrance and the fruit is taken off the nut is separated the fruit is squeezed immediately to get the juice out of it mm -hmm. and drunk fresh it's absolutely what, what do they call it what's the fruit it's called the cashew. it's called a cashew apple actually mm -hmm. a cashew apple okay yeah. we don't get those here do we no no except through supermarkets because now they're coming in here you can I actually see them here i've never seen i them. saw a couple but yeah. they came in from ecuador or something but these this is another fruit that the portuguese took like the mango mm -hmm. from mm -hmm. uh, south america to Africa and then to mm -hmm. India. Today, India is exporting both the right. uh, mango and the stuff. Now, the nut itself, the, 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 the fruit is squeezed mm -hmm. into uh, a juice, which is then fermented at different levels mm -hmm. for different strength alcohol. This is the great contribution of the Jesuits to mm -hmm. Goa. They taught them how to distill liquor. You know, mm -hmm. If you thought it was all about saints and prayers, they brought a lot of other stuff <laughs> as well. They brought the printing press. We hear a lot of we hear a lot of stories about the Jesuits. Yeah, yeah. The nuts um, inside this kernel, uh, the nuts are separated by mm -hmm. roasting them first and then opening up. It's very hard to open it when it's raw. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the only thing you eat at the end, and you just do it like that, is that nut. Mm -hmm. But the labor-intensive process, and it's a part of the culture there. So right. these were things that uh, all sort of creep into these stories. But the story is basically a human one of a family migration and a community m migrating to a new country, mm -hmm. taking roots, settling, adapting, and then converting. Well, it sounds like you're really painting a picture. I mean, you've, you've, you've taken me there just telling this story mm -hmm. this morning. Well, I, I find myself in the middle of the Indian Ocean on a raft of some sort. How did the, the boy in your book get across the Indian Ocean? He got across in a steam ship in those mm -hmm. days. They ran the first 
on his outward trip, he went out on a coal-fired steamer. Now, did you make that trip yourself? Yes. I did both trips, yeah. there and back. And, um, but to give you an idea of what it was like uh, compared to the little cruise ships, the big cruise ships you go right. on now, these would carry about uh, 1,800 passengers, mm -hmm. of whom about 400 would be on the first and second class. You're talking about the steamships that you took? Yeah. Well, maybe even less, 200 maybe. That's a lot of people. Yeah. 1,800 yeah. people? Wow. Yeah. yeah, a lot of people. But most of them were crowded on deck. Mm -hmm. And deck uh, in those ships were uh, a painted deck mm -hmm. with markings a bit like a car park. Wow. This was for the very poor. And they would be allowed a certain amount of minimum uh, hand baggage, as it were, which they used to separate families one from the other. And so uh, you had your little marked area? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you uh, set up a tent or anything? No, I was lucky because my father was a bit more fortunate. We traveled on economy class and then there was the first class which we nobody touched. But uh, we walked in there and they had these uh, folks in their sort of spaces, parking spaces. And during the day the women would roll up all the bedrolls, the men mm -hmm. would get into little groups and organize card games and play poker for 10 days. Mm -hmm. The kids would run around wow. like Sounds crazy. Sounds like fun. It yeah. was fun. It was really fun. <laughs> <laughs> was fun. And then one day I got to a corner around the back there to explore with these other boys my age. And there's live goats and they had to carry these for the Muslim population mm -hmm. who had to eat, uh, you know, meat uh, slaughtered the halal way. Um, on the way back, we got a different boat. This time it's been converted because it was one that was requisitioned for the Royal Navy. And none of the troop, troops were going to travel in those conditions. Mm -hmm. So for them, they had to convert these into hospital ships mm -hmm. or other types of troop carriers. But by this stage, they had introduced double bunk steel beds. Mm -hmm. And this particular one had converted into diesel at this stage, and it was all a totally big upgrade, as they say in today's lingo. Which trip did you like best, better, the, the first one or the second one? Mm -hmm. uh, the first one I enjoyed because it was so incredibly out of this world, and the second one I enjoyed because I was coming home. I had escaped from boarding school. Oh. I didn't even notice the <laughs> ship. Oh, yeah, right. And, and, and how long is the journey? Ten days. Ten days. Ten days. Mm. So that sounds like, uh, that sounds like an awesome journey, experience. Yeah. Now, what year would that have been? 1950. And how old were you at the time? I was 10 going out and 11 coming back, 11 and a half coming yeah. back. Wow. So this book is kind of your story in a sense, or uh, certainly inspired by Yeah, you. every first story has uh, a personal story because mm -hmm. you've got to build on something. Yeah. Right. But um, having started to write it, I had uh, started to write a different story. Uh, how much time have I got? I could keep you busy. Here Not too time. much more time. We got a, a couple more minutes, Brad. Okay. So. Yeah, the original story was the father coming out, uh, two brothers, all orphans and a girl, mm -hmm. also orphaned by the time the eldest was 18, the youngest was 12. Mm -hmm. The girl of 12 was put into a convent because there was nobody to look after her. Uh, the eldest went to Mozambique, mm -hmm. Portuguese, Africa, where there were jobs. The second went into a seminary but about a year before uh, graduation or ordain, uh, ordination, had to leave. He decided that, that wasn't for him and he went to Africa, he was crossing, mm -hmm. going to cross to Angola and then go to South America, to Brazil. But he died of malaria on the way because you walked across Africa those days. It took three yeah. or four months, it wasn't very fast, but he died. And my dad ended up in East Africa. And I was going mm -hmm. to write these stories because it took me 50 years to then find the other family. Because the two brothers brought up their families, one in Mos Portuguese Africa and one in British mm -hmm. Kenya. But they weren't allowed to talk to each other for all the time that Salazar was in charge because of being a dictatorship and nobody wanted to deal with him. And so it took me 50 years. I was going to write that story, but as I started to get into the details of the other one, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. this uh, became the story. It's interesting. And that's why I had to divide it into three, otherwise I would never have enough time for interviews and no time for mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> writing the whole story. Right. 
Well, it sounds like it's uh, you're really going to be taking people on a, a journey with this book here. I hope so. And it's interesting how the book kind of finds itself, right? This mm -hmm. this yeah. obviously was the book that needed to, to right, get written. to be written first, right? yeah. Mm -hmm. So now are you doing any... Um, a book launch or a, any readings in public that people... I've done a number of book launches and uh, mm -hmm. there's been a very positive reaction. As I'm uh, self-published, it's that much more mm -hmm. uh, difficult. You have to sell each book one at a time right. or by word of mouth and uh, that's happening. But uh, that's, you know, why we're here to help Absolutely. push the word out. So I know there's some people watching, mm -hmm. either now or in the future, that uh, are going to be uh, compelled to, uh, to get a copy of the book. What's the best way for them to do that, Brass? Yeah, I uh, said you have a commercial for that, or? Well, we, uh, that's okay. You know, it's, uh, mm -hmm. we have, uh, we want to get the information, so yes. yeah. Yeah, well, I'm going to give you the information. I'm going to <laughs> have a little, I drafted a little announcement here. Oh, perfect. It says, hi, my name, is Braz Menezes. I'm the author of Just Matata, Sin, Saints and Settlers, a novel set in Goa and Kenya in mid-20th century. If you enjoy good historic fiction that is also fun to read, join me in an armchair travel through a world of steam engines and steamers, an exotic world of romance and adventure and innocence. Just Matata is available on Amazon.com and also and as, as an e-book on Kindle. Please email me at matatabooks at gmail.com or visit my website matatatrilogy.com. Great. Matatatrilogy.com. Right. Sounds great, Braz. And are you working on the, the next book now? Yes, uh, I'm working on the next book. and. Uh, is that going to be the completion of that when you started writing or something altogether different? It's going to learn from this one and mm -hmm. uh, make sure that readers who are expecting to find out a bit more about what happened after this one mm -hmm. are not disappointed but also are taken into a new dimension because the world changes continuously and each of the books in the trilogy are set in a different time frame all of which created by conditions outside the control of communities. Mm -hmm. you know, the big decisions, like here and everywhere else, are taken mm -hmm. by people a long way away who then tell you what they've done. That's what this whole Occupy movement's all about. Yes. Right? Exactly. Do you think we're ever going to be able to turn that around and have it so that people can make the decisions that affect them? No, I think what's important about that movement is, uh, first, that it... For it uh, it sends a message that something is very wrong mm -hmm. with our society, mm -hmm. which it is. You just have to look around. Right. And uh, there's both a global where, uh, view of where it's wrong, but it's also at the local level. Yeah. I mean, just look how our city has gone, is going downhill mm -hmm. in the last couple of years mm -hmm. with nothing but gloom and doom. And so I think, you know, it mobilizes people to say, listen, enough's enough. There are better ways of doing the same thing. Okay. Well... Thank you. So, Braz, thanks for coming in today and, and doing this. We've got to get you back because I know yes. we could yeah. go all day on this stuff. But it's Thank uh, you. thanks for taking us on a trip across the Indian Ocean. Yeah. Yes, and Thank, Thank you, you very for much for the time. The painting in the <laughs> Copa del Mar, and it just yeah. kind of took us there. Yeah. So it's awesome. Thank you. awesome. Okay. Thanks. thanks. So let's take a little break, and we're going to come back. Diane St. John is here all the way from Hamilton. We're going to be talking about the uh, Canadian Unity Travel Club. We'll be right back.
Okay. Go train or what? I, I, oh. A go bus to... Hey, ah, we're back we're on, <laughs> we're on the air now. Welcome. So we're finding out how you got here. So you took the go bus from Hamilton. Go bus from Hamilton to Union Station and then underground subway from there to here. See, the go bus is cheaper, right? But if you want to just uh, get back quick with the bus, the other mm -hmm. bus, you know, like the Greyhound, is right next door. Mm -hmm. you got to pay a little bit more, but... Oh, I see. Oh. You know, it's more comfortable it's than those painful. go buses. <laughs> Right. If you don't know your way around <laughs> underground, it gets hectic yeah. in Toronto. Have you got your return ticket already? Yes. Okay, okay so you're going to be time. taking the gold bus anyway. But This is Diane St. John. She's here. She's from Hamilton. Uh, and we're talking about the Canadian Unity Travel Club. Now, it's a phenomenal idea. Now, uh, yes. before you get into how you did this, what is the essential idea of, of the Canadian Unity Travel Club? Okay. The Travel Club was created so that Canadians of many different cultures could come together and learn about each other through travel and through a cultural exchange staying with one another. Yeah. It's cultural, it's cuisine, it's accommodation, it's a combination of everything. Yeah. And um, they can travel within Ontario or through other provinces of Canada. We handle the reservations for them and all they have to do is call us on our 800 number and we book them into another location. Uh, with a family of a totally different culture. Okay, so that's okay. So, as putting myself in the shoes of one of these travelers, mm -hmm. these or, Canadians. Or, yes, or a, first of all, you're a member of the club. You got to join the club, okay? Yes, you're a member of the Canadian Unity Travel Club. Then you call us and okay. you say, I, I want to go to so and so. And we then um, look in that location to find out what accommodations we have available yeah. with another member of our club. Right. And then we uh, book you. So uh, when you join, you're both a tourist and a... Yeah, the whole idea of being a member of the club is really to meet other Canadians of a totally different culture. So in order to do that, you really need to travel or move mm -hmm. around a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So that's why it's called a travel club. But really, it's a cultural exchange of different mm -hmm. cultures of Canadians, and okay. uh, and they're and we're because we have to facilitate them moving back and forth. Uh, we do that for them for a reserva on the reservation side. But they handle the transportation. Uh, we don't. We're not a travel agent, so. Okay. So they can take the go bus. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> or the yeah. other bus. Or any okay. bus. <laughs> um, so okay, how much does it cost to join? Uh, it's for a family of four. It's two hundred dollars. Forever. Does that last forever? For it's annual. Oh, every year. Yeah. Every okay. year, it's two hundred dollars for a family of four. What if you're only a couple? Well, actually, the registration form is made up for four people. So if you're a couple, yeah. then mm -hmm. you can register your mom and dad, or your aunt and uncle, or your grandparents. So you got to find two other people. No, no, no. You, they, they can be a member of the club. <laughs> they don't have to travel with you. No, no. Except but it's packaged but for four. it's a package for right. four, and so they they can be in part of your package, or they can pay you hundred dollars and and uh, be part of your package. Right. Whatever you like. So it's two hundred dollars a year, whether or not you got four. People. Yeah, it's for four. Mm -hmm. We like to register four people. It's really designed around a um, family. Families. So it's mom and dad and two children is what, is what the concept really started out as. All right. Okay. So now somebody wants, so now you're a member of the club and mm -hmm. you want to travel somewhere. They call you and they say, I want to go to, say, Yellowknife. <laughs> okay. All right. Just because. <laughs> Just because. Then what well, happens? Then, well, then, of course, then we, as a member, you have a, a membership registration number and we just, key that into the computer and mm -hmm. it pulls up your profile and then we could go into yellow knife and we would look around to see how many pro uh, members we have registered mm -hmm. there you you can be a member you don't necessarily have to be a host and a member you can just be a member okay. so we then have to go into yellow knife and find out how many members are hosts that we've qualified and uh, we would almost book you like a hotel in the sense that we find out you would do you want double or queen do you want twin beds mm -hmm. do you want private bath all that kind of thing. It's just that kind of a, a way so that you get mm -hmm. exactly what you want when you're traveling. All these properties are already approved by the company. All right. So, like, if somebody joins and they want to be a host, then do they get paid? Uh, yeah. They get paid by the other the other member. Yes. And who sets the price of well, the, the well, of we the set it sort of a general price across the board for Canada, mm -hmm. so that everybody knew what you're going to expect and what you're going to pay. But but it's one member pays the other member. Okay. So and and the rate is, uh, it's one hundred and eighty-five dollars for four, mm -hmm. right? And it's one hundred and five dollars for a couple, and oh. that includes a full breakfast. Is that per night? F that's for day per day because per day. you get your accommodation, you get your full breakfast and a full gourmet dinner in the evening as well. That's amazing. So, so they have to cook too. <laughs> you have to be a chef. But that's what you do when you're. Uh, it's like a B and B thing. Mm -hmm. Except it's just we're you know we're going a little bit beyond that concept. It's more family. It's almost right. just like you're really bringing in some relatives you've never met before. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So how how would that work in regards to? I mean, people are obviously open in order to want to do this. They want yes. to experience other cultures and they want yes. the family environment. Yes. But because it's so cozy and a very different idea, how would it be dealt with if there is a clash when the people come together? Well, then of course, then they call us. Okay. Yeah. And it's our job to make sure before we even send them there mm -hmm. that uh, th they have something in common, whether it's their profession. Of course, it has to be an age group, say, around the same age group. Mm -hmm. You know, some, something that really draws them together culturally, maybe for some reason. And uh, then it's up to us. If there's a problem, then of course they just pick up the phone and call us and we solve it. Okay. okay, I have a hypothetical situation for you. Okay. Yeah, you get somebody, they want to go to Yellowknife. You look through your <laughs> database, and you only have one person in Yellowknife, and and they don't click. You match. don't know, you know, like it's it's a tenuous connection yes. at best, right? So then we just don't do the booking. Oh, okay. Because your membership is for one year, you can call us as many times as you want in one year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if we just don't have the availability, we just don't because it's, we're not commercial. You know, right. We're very private. It's it's a very personal kind of a membership base and. And that's we we'd like to keep it, you know. Absolutely. Now, so what was the origin of this concept? Because you're doing it, as you said, it's not commercial. No. You're doing it for well, other it, reasons. It's, well, when I say commercial, it's not like it, it's uh, a building, and you know, you're you're dealing with the public all the time. Because we we don't deal with the public at all. Mm -hmm. It's everything's done by the internet or by the telephone. But the concept started back in Vancouver, when I was in Vancouver, and um, not sure just what year. 
too many years ago, uh, I started a bed and breakfast registry, the very first one in Canada. Mm -hmm. And from that, it grew from 100, from one bedrooms to 100 bedrooms and 100 properties. And then the Canadian government asked me to represent them for the World's Fair. So I went from 100 properties to 1,300 properties. And so this is how the concept started, it was just putting mm -hmm. people together. And mm -hmm. these were people from all over the world coming to Vancouver for the 86th Fair. And uh, so with that concept really solidly in place, I decided to bring it out here. Wow. That's so amazing. That's really cool. So you helped get what, th these are the people that were coming to Canada to go to the World's Fair and you were putting them in bed and breakfast. Yeah, I was putting them in private homes. Yeah. And it was, was exactly that, just bed and breakfast. But our hosts were wonderful. It, it must have been a great experience for to everyone. have the hosts. And I know, I've got some experience with these kind of, mm -hmm. well, because what you're doing, you're facilitating essentially cultural exchanges it, right, right. across mm -hmm. the country. Yes. And I've got a little bit of experience that whether it's yeah. uh, um, with, uh, well, my hometown, Welland, mm -hmm. has a twin city yes. in Quebec. Yes. Sorel, Quebec. And we th there would always be these cultural, numerous cultural so we would go to Sorel and stay in their houses yes. and they would come stay. and they would stay with us yes. and then we had a big hockey exchange once with yeah. Sweden yeah. and the whole city got caught up in in all and everybody was just having a great time yeah they do this right across Canada in little towns and villages they're doing this that's mm -hmm. what bed and breakfast has just grown in leaps and bounds mm -hmm. be because it's the hospitality aspect of it and the home atmosphere that you get and the friendliness and mm -hmm. you end up becoming a friend with these people you know mm -hmm. so we've just taken that just one step beyond because I'm out here in central Canada mm -hmm. and not too far from where there's a huge multicultural center which is Toronto mm -hmm. and so the need is there f to bring these cultures together, to take them out of these clusters, these, uh, you know, these cultural clusters that everyone is in, and mm -hmm. start doing some exchanges, mm -hmm. and, and getting Canadians to know one another, and then it, it just spreads from there, because then they're not afraid, an Italian Canadian, or a German Canadian, or a Dutch Canadian, is they're not afraid to, want to explore Canada, mm -hmm. and stay with another Canadian, because they've done it in their own town, mm -hmm. right. through this project, through this program. Mm -hmm. I think this is amazing. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. a lot of fun. So wh what we're trying to do, of course, is get as many Canadians as possible involved in one way or another, you know? Yeah. There's many ways that they can get in involved. Now, do you have people already in every province and no, territory? No, no I, in the bed and breakfast industry. But th this, is not, this is not that. We can't, mm -hmm. because bed and breakfast hosts by tradition only want to serve a breakfast yeah and, and and they're not there to entertain so much as to provide a service yeah okay but this is just quite a bit different than that mm -hmm. because our job or our, our members jobs is to entertain so it's to take the other member golfing or take them fishing or take them sightseeing mm -hmm. or go shopping with them mm -hmm. showing take them to the theater showing them something cultural but right. getting them involved in that community that's the whole idea so that it's more mm -hmm. than just it's not a touristy thing at all it's mm -hmm. more it's more like it's more like a real cultural exchange yeah mm -hmm. a real uh, and and what often happens in these things is you become friends with people and then you're friends for life after that that's right, right? and the children it's a great education for children yeah mm -hmm. because they at a very young age you know nowadays here in Toronto they meet all kinds of multicultural children and there's in the classroom but generally speaking across Canada you don't get that opportunity the right. children yeah. don't get that opportunity so this is a way for them to meet a Canadian of a totally different culture and, and get used to them from a very young age the fact that yeah. we live in a multicultural society yeah. and we always will now yeah right I can even see this evolving into just being like for teenagers young adults to be able to do the exchange as well in the same way yes even mm -hmm. young adults exactly mm -hmm. but because we have um, uh, we we have food involved you know, it's a cuisine experience as well, so it's not mm -hmm. just a cultural. We're, we try to bring in hosts, member hosts that are good cooks, mm -hmm. that love to cook. I was going to ask about that. Yeah, what if they're not? <laughs> what if they don't right. love to cook? Oh, well, they, that's, part of the, the, uh, that's part of the reason we would take them on as a host. Mm -hmm. Not everybody is going to be taken Absolutely. on as a host, only those that qualify. Yeah. And so one of the things is congeniality, availability, being a good cook, loving to cook, loving to entertain, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. Okay, now you've got a great track record in this, in this industry already with, with your experience in Vancouver for the Expo. But um, you, it's, this is one of those things where you need a lot of people in the network 
to to make it work right because you want to be able to match people properly you want to be able to have people in almost every location that people might want to go right eventually yeah but you <laughs> got takes time yeah so um and and it sounds like you've got you know you're not just willing to take anybody they need to have uh you know they got to meet your specifications Standard, right which is yeah. understandable but i'm just wondering do you did you you know did you do some market research to show you know that that it was I'm oh, just of to, to to do you know that there are people out there that oh, will yes, be, of course. be able to meet those specs, right? Because we know that the bed and breakfast industry has grown in leaps and bounds, and why it has is because people like to stay in a bed and breakfast. Mm -hmm. Okay, I keep pushing bed and breakfast, but I should be pushing, <laughs> you know, my my Canadian the travel club. Right. But the concept is the same; it's home hospitality, yeah. and people like that. They really do like that. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to be difficult across Canada. Get to encourage Canadians of different mm -hmm. cultures to come together, and some of them will want to be hosts. You know what? It kind of reminds me of, uh, I mean, because a, a lot of people entertain the idea of, of turning their home into a bed and breakfast, right? Mm -hmm. But it's almost like with this, for that low price of $200, they're already in the business, in a way. That's all they have to do. Well, they just have to be a member. Yeah. But then they have to be approved by us, too. Right. right. So they have to send us pictures of their property. Yeah. And all that, yes, yeah. So it's just—it's more than just being a member. Mm -hmm. But the the whole idea, we'd like a lot of Canadians and multicultural Canadians to become members of the club, so they, they we can start doing this exchange and getting mm -hmm. these different cultures coming together. Mm -hmm. Okay. And now, are you marketing in? I always thought this would be a great idea, based on my own experience, right? Yes. To to take people in French-speaking parts of the country and match them up with English, just for national unity yes. purposes, mm -hmm. and that's yes. the name of your club. The Canadian Unity Travel Club. Like, yeah. are you marketing in French too? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, well, not right at the moment, but we will be. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Because I mean, that would be a, just a great thing right there, just to get to French and oh, English-speaking yes. Canadians. Well, I, uh, I lived in Montreal for a while. Yeah. For several years mm -hmm. during the the other World's Fair, mm -hmm. I lived in Montreal, in '67. That was a good year. Yeah, that was a good year, and uh, and so you you know you really got to know French Canadians, and of course they're just wonderful people too, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, but a lot of them are bilingual, they speak both yeah. languages, yeah. and of course part of our project naturally is to, uh, is to get them involved, and of course I, I'm looking forward to getting the maritime people involved, mm -hmm. which is going to be so much fun. Yeah. And of course, you know, I'm from Western Canada, so of course I know the right. hospitality that comes from the Western Canadians. Right. So all in all, once we get this moving along and get these Canadians involved, mm -hmm. it's, it's going to be fun for everyone. So are all the hosts in Newfoundland going to have to offer the opportunity for their guests to get screeched I in? I knew you say that. Uh, you knew that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> are they going to? They're going to have to kiss the cod? Yeah. And, and, <laughs> and, and, and drink the screech. The screech, oh screech, the screech yeah. The screech. Well, we're not going to maybe go that far. But <laughs> <laughs> well, I want it to go that far. Do you? Maybe further. He wants that experience. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. No, this just has endless potential. Like it's, it's amazing, and I think we do need this kind of a thing to just bring people together. Yeah. Even if people don't realize they like this, I think a lot of people are needing it in their life and yes. not realizing it. Yeah. And I yeah. think, yeah, I think so. Then we have new, what we call new Canadians, mm -hmm. newcomers to Canada. 500,000 every year mm -hmm. um, and they're settling in our major centers Toronto Vancouver Montreal and they they feel lonely because they're they're away from their homeland mm -hmm. and maybe they didn't bring family with them maybe they come here to get settled in to, before they bring their family right and so they have a, a very small uh, family group there with this is a great opportunity for them to get into the Canadian way of life mm -hmm. get introduced to Canada yeah. and Canadians mm -hmm. and uh, make a friend yep. mm -hmm feel less lonely and see the country and see the, the whole country. country and then they can see the whole country yeah. but I, i'm just thinking even locally not too far away absolutely because you know you can you can be a, a member in toronto and a member in in markham or you know like really close by and mm -hmm. still have a great relationship going yeah from two totally different cultures absolutely or even just uh, i mean you know i mean how many people take day trips that's just, right just in a, you know within a day's travel to Toronto, yeah, yeah. And, and you're experiencing something totally, totally different. Totally different. Mm -hmm. yeah. You're seeing a really nice part of Ontario that you've never seen before. Yeah. You're staying with a wonderful Canadian family of a different culture. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and as I had mentioned before, some of them may, uh, may want to go there eventually and move there for business or Absolutely. for a new job. And so they've got an opportunity to see that location before they make that final decision. 
mm -hmm. and they're not staying in a hotel and not learning about the community whereas you do that when you're staying with a family mm -hmm. they want they're very proud of their community that's the one mm -hmm. thing about them and they're always willing to tell you as much as they can yeah about, that's true. about who they are and a little bit about their background and take you places and see i would almost think that uh, dealing with the new canadians is almost a whole separate part of the business with a slightly different marketing no, message well, well in a way it is but we we just trying to put a big umbrella around this calling it canadian yeah you know we don't want to differentiate between new and old or whatever yeah. but we we just have a lot to offer everyone really yeah mm -hmm. no, that's and, great. and the older folks you know they travel uh, they're they're now wanting to have more a personal experience, you know, like uh, they're retired and they're maybe want to take it, like you say, a day trip by car or mm -hmm. whatever. This is a nice thing for them too because they feel very secure. It's a very safe and secure way to stay. Mm -hmm. You don't have to worry about somebody having a key to your room or. Well, you know, plus you don't have to worry about uh, even going into a hotel where you don't really know the people and yeah. whatever. Here you got somebody probably waiting for you. Yeah, waiting uh, for you. You know, I mean, I and and. You know, I just have to say the hospitality. Uh, last year, I was out in uh, Drumheller, or Alberta. Oh, yeah. You know, staying at a B and B. Did the, you? The, yeah, and the people were so. You know, they picked us up. Oh, uh, you know. That's oh, nice. can we send a car over? Uh, you know, and it's just you know you get that when you're dealing at this kind of very personal level, level right? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. You you take them on almost like we always say you come in as a stranger and you leave as a friend. That's kind of like what the bed and breakfast used to say. Yeah. But that's, that's, just, that's just really what it is, mm -hmm. is because, I mean, I remember in my home in North Vancouver, I used to take guests, and we used to take them like two or three days at a time. Here, it's a minimum of three days, mm -hmm. so you can get to know them. But in, in Vancouver, like, I would take them up the mountain, and I would do different things with them, Did you, know? you walk up <laughs> to Grouse Mountain? I just took them to the plateau and said, there. <laughs> you're on your own. <laughs> if you make it, we'll see you on the way yeah. back. If you make it. Yeah, we'll see you for, we'll see you for breakfast. <laughs> but, no, but it, it has its wonderful flavors to it. And, uh, like you say, it's an experience you don't forget, yeah. mm -hmm. really. That's great. So we're hoping that this is something that all Canadians will say, gee, I'd like to be part of this. And... And uh, and if they don't want to be host, that's okay. You don't have yeah. to be a host. You yes. can just be a traveler. Okay. Sounds great. Now, how can people find out more and how can they get in touch? Mm -hmm. Well, we have, of course, we have a website and we have a blog. Our website is www.canadianunitytravelclub.ca. That's our website. And that's you can register on that website. And then our, our email is the same thing except info at... CanadianUnityTravelClub.ca, so it's the same thing. And then our blog, which is a link, is called Proud to Be Canadian, which is proud and then to be Canadian with the to be. What do you mean, like spelled like, out? Like a two and then a be mm -hmm. Canadian. Yeah. Number two. Oh, okay. proud to be Canadian. Canadian. Yeah, that's our blog, and on both. What is it though? Dot the what? Dot. Uh, well, the. Or what? It just links for the thing. No, it's it's a link. Just proud to be Canadian. All right. Okay. On the website, we're looking at it right there, right? Oh, okay. About the blog. About this blog. Oh, this is the blog right there. Yeah. And there you see all the different Canadians of different cultures. Mm -hmm. Yep. Awesome. Yeah, it is awesome. It is it's awesome. Great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's refreshing. It's great to always hear these kind of ideas. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So uh, they go on the website and they could just register right there. Canadian U uh, yeah, Canadian yeah. Unity Travel Club. Yes. Yeah, so when they go on the web, we have there's you know whole sidebar of all kinds of topics. We just I just filled it full of. Mm -hmm. information for them okay and on the there is a section where they can register for as a member yeah but on the blog called proud to be canadian there's also a, a section in there where they can tell us in 500 words or a thousand words why they're proud to be a canadian mm -hmm. and then we give them free membership and stuff like that free membership yeah there's free membership okay but you got to fill it out you got to tell you you, you got to tell us why you're that's a proud a great canadian contest. that's a great contest for you guys to be running yeah, because we'll get people from all different cultures coming in and saying why they're proud to be Canadian. And, and a lot of them may be new Canadians, established Canadian, you know, second generation. I'm fourth generation Canadian, so. Mm -hmm. so okay, well, listen, good luck with this project. It sounds exciting. Thank and you very uh, much. maybe you should come back and bring some of those stories, some of those reasons why people oh. are proud to be Canadian. Oh, yes, we could do right? that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah. let us know how it's developing. Yeah. yeah, that would be great. I would love to do that. Okay. Thank you very much. All right, Diane. Thanks for coming Thank in today. You. Yeah. All the way from Hamilton? Yes. All right. So uh, I guess that's the show, Aaron. Yes. So now what are we yeah. going to do? What are you going to do, Diane? Are you going to go for lunch or something? Could. While you're in the big city? Could do. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
You're in a perfect location. There's everything all around. E everything's so. around? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then I'm looking forward to getting back home. Yeah. I'm not the big city girl anymore. No. I used to have an office on Bay and Queen mm -hmm. a few years back and lived in, you know, see, big, big, the big T.O. See, I'm from Welland, so to me, Hamilton's a big city, <laughs> right? Yeah, I suppose, yeah. <laughs> I suppose, uh, but uh, but uh, I, I'm just getting to the point where it's just too big for me now. Like mm -hmm. you know, yeah. I'm just finding it too. It's getting yeah. yeah. You're it's done with it. I yeah. Although yeah. if you lived here and you, it it's just a small town. Everybody knows everybody. It's really yeah, really. It yeah, is yeah. kind of crazy. Yeah. Huh? yeah. <laughs> so well, it was very nice talking to you. Yeah. So thanks Thank for you. coming in today, and yeah. uh, Aaron, uh, that's the show. And uh, so you'll be back next week, next right? Next Wednesday. And uh, Wednesday. we'll be back uh, tomorrow at noon for more local lunch. Stay tuned. The Wine Lady's coming up in about 10 minutes right here on thatchannel.com. See you tomorrow. Baby alone.